from the Fathead Studio in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Man, am I still pretty? And he's like, you ain't pretty, but you're going to be all right. And now I'm just hanging on, looking at the wall, like flying this way. And I'm like, oh, man, I got to let go of this thing at some point. And then there's one that could literally pick you up. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, I'm not really sure about that, but yeah. That's called a helicopter. Well, <laughs> and the last lap was just chaos. I mean, like four wide, five wide. It's like, whatever, if you land it and send it into the fence, you're probably not going to get hurt. Bounce and then this insane roll, the car that Keegan was in. I mean, it. I don't know it's the shape of the beetle or what, but that thing sent it. So I was a supercharger specialist on my uh, old man's car. With specialist? Robert yeah, it sounds cooler than crew guy. <laughs> <laughs> I am Tony Stewart. I'm Mario Andretti. I'm Christy Lee. I'm Alexander Rossi. I'm Cruz Pedregon. Hey, I'm Antron Brown, and this is The Skinny. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to The Skinny. We're in the middle of the Mav TV booth. I'm Ken Stout. That is Rico Elmore sitting right alongside the staff here back behind us doing a great job. Steve Grind cutting the show together. Greg Hunter's taking care of our audio. Bill on a camera. And Arlen, who I've worked with since the late 90s, early 2000s, something like that. Great to have, uh, great to have Arlen back in the game here as well with us. Certainly excited about this one. We've got a pair of cats here that are extremely good at what they do. So looking forward to uh, talking to Hall of Famers here. The Binks boys are in the house. Dan Binks, his son, Phil Binks. Uh, if we talk about Dan, by the way, congratulations. Recently inducted into the Corvette Hall of Fame. Pretty cool honor right there. And if you're not familiar with the name, he's no, he's not a driver. Neither one of these guys are drivers, but they have uh, put the drivers in really, really good places. So crew chiefs that are extremely talented. And uh, Dan's tenure with Team Corvette, uh, they've earned... Well over 100 wins along the way. Tell me if this is correct. Six 24 hours of Le Mans, three 24 hours of Daytonas, 11 12 hours of Sebring. And honestly, when I say that, it's just a scratch of the surface of all of the wins that you guys had with that team. Nothing short of exceptional, man. Congratulations. And then you finally retired, or so they call that. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But man, what a great tenure you had with that team. Yeah, I was super fortunate to be at Corvette from 2002 to 2020. Yeah, I think it was 110 races or something like that. Anyways, uh, just amazing. And then, you know, we did stuff with Jack Roush before that, Tommy Kendall, a bunch of different people, you know, Greg Biffle, we won a championship with him. So been super fortunate in motorsports. And uh, now Phil and I are partnering up. So it'll be yeah, we're going to touch on all of that along the way. We definitely want to touch on your career. We want to find out how that uh, transitioned in, into Phil growing up and, and his career. So, And to touch on Phil as well, Phil um, obviously growing up in the shadows of this legendary guy here ends up working at Chip Ganassi Racing for a number of years, taking care of their DPI cars, now GTP cars, and uh, they've stepped away and created, is it is it Binks Motorsports? Yes, it is. Yep. So, uh, and you guys are still taking care of those those high-end cars. We'll certainly, we'll certainly touch on that. Um, reading along the way, um, I was surprised that uh, your father, I guess, was your father involved in racing. And then he moved to, um, he moved to Southern California and you started, he started rubbing shoulders with Ken Miles. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So my dad's driver instructor was Ken Miles uh, in the 50s. And uh, he was a family friend till you know, he was passed. And uh, but yeah, my dad club raced from 49 to 2011. So pretty long career. And uh, he's passed now, but uh, we still own one of Ken's cars. So that's super really cool. Yeah, we still own one of Ken Miles cars from the 60s. Was so. that a Corvette? No. It was a Formula Junior. It was actually made in San Diego, but uh, my dad drove it till he stopped racing. So, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty wild to have that that legacy continue on or to start off there. Do you uh, you spent the the early part of your life or, or a number of years uh, of your life in SoCal, right? Yeah. So I grew up in in San Diego, moved to L.A., uh, worked for Phil Connie, and then I worked for Clayton Cunningham. Uh, that. Was, Clayton Cunningham is really where I started to first start winning a bunch of races uh, with Jack Baldwin and Tommy Kendall. We won uh, four GTU championships all in a row uh, when I first started. So I was a mechanic at Phil Connie's and then a crew chief at at uh, CCR, Clayton Cunningham Racing. And that was uh, 85. It was the first year that I was a crew chief and proceeded to win 85, 86, 87, 88, 89. 
Uh, we missed an 89 and we won a 90 in, with Tommy. So there was a bunch of races in there that started it out. When did you figure out that this was something you loved and, and you didn't chase? Did you ever chase being a driver? I tried being a driver and uh, it turns out my Visa and my MasterCard were both full. And <laughs> and I just <laughs> and I just like, hey, man, I can't do this. And uh, I was just better at working at them. You know, I just uh, I could see what needed to be done and and just built my skills surrounded by a bunch of good people. And and uh, a lot of them didn't think I would make it because I was kind of ricochet rabbit at the be- at the beginning, just uh, couldn't concentrate on all the the right things but uh it, it took a little while but uh it paid off in the long run where'd you learn the work ethic from my dad my dad and some of their friends um either we were working on my dad's cars or uh, a guy named fuzzy stewart he raced Dotsons, and we would go there and work all night long and then go back to school or you know uh just uh from one one car to the other helping your buddies out and uh a Fiat guy, we used to buy Fiat parts from a place called PBS. Uh, he got me my first break, and uh, that's where I went to Phil Connie's. He said, hey, this kid can work. You know, he he's not too bad. And uh, <laughs> away it went. So it was what I'm always intrigued with is we see so many people that, you know, they have their jobs and they, they go into work at eight o'clock in the morning and they get off at five and then they don't want to do a minute more. But to survive in this industry survive in this industry but to excel in this industry you can forget about all of that oh. and the one thing that kept popping up when i was doing my homework on you is the amazing amount of of work matter of fact i want to say it was a story that i read about jack roush who came in at i don't know some crazy two in the morning two in the morning and you're running around doing stuff in the shop and you look up and say hey jack and he looks over and says hey dan and everybody just keeps on like it's <laughs> normal you know, yeah like it's two o'clock in the afternoon that's a, a great story actually i was there because somebody at our shop was telling other teams what we were doing and it was when i first started nascar trucks with greg biffle and uh so i would go in at two in the morning and do all the special work and uh jack Jack never sleeps. He's similar to what, you know, I do, you know, and uh, I just found that I needed to go there at that time in the morning and I could get four or five hours worth of work in before somebody would tell somebody what we were doing. So uh, did you ever find the mole? Yeah, no, I knew who it was. Yeah, And Jack actually called him out. Uh, we had a meeting and Jack called him out and uh, it was pretty cool because we told him we were going somewhere that we weren't going. So then they leaked the mole, <laughs> laid and, the trap, and, wow, and hook, and hook line and sinker. It. He he uh, he took it bait. And, uh, it was awesome, and only Jack's form can make somebody feel real bad. And uh, whatever it worked out, but it's unfortunate that it, that happens. But I think it happens more than you think. Oh yeah, I would think so as well. That's uh, trying trying to make those gains is pretty hard. So if you can get them the easy way, <laughs> it makes life a little bit simpler. Yeah. So great stuff here off and running here with both Dan and Phil Binks. We're going to take a quick break here. We have plenty to cover here with these guys. Stay with us. Phil runs in there and gets the spare, put it on there, and away we go. The Skinny is brought to you by Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. And American Coach. Innovation is our life force. Welcome back to The Skinny. We're having a great time here with both Dan and Phil Binks. Looking forward to this one to dig in a little bit deeper. I love the father-son relationship. It's kind of uh, it's kind of unique, if you will, the fact that they both at the very top end of the game and doing what they do. Was there a... First of all, by the way, congratulations on Sebring. So we have to touch base on that. These guys are fresh out of Sebring. Just starting Binks Motorsports with the two of them, as we talked about, touched on briefly in in the first segment. Um, But as it turns out, and I did not realize this had happened, not that I should, but uh, the Ganassi cars that you used to race on, 2022 cars, which are now vintage cars, <laughs> are down in Sebring. You guys are taking care of both of those Cadillacs and uh, chatting with, with Dan. I said, hey, man, we want to get you on the show here at PRI. And he says, yeah, we're on our way back from from Sebring. We just won down there. And I, I said to him, I said, well, duh, you should win. Those are 2022 Cadillacs. I mean, those things are beautiful. He says, oh, hold on. He said, the accurates were there. I'm like, what? We have full-on IMSA racing going on at SVRA. So is that what was an SVRA event? It was uh, HSR. HSR. HSR so classic. I thought they were one and the same. So I thought Tony Perella 
merged HSR into SBRA? I don't, I don't no? know that. No, IMSA owns it. Oh, do they? Yeah. Okay. So, so you guys were down there with a couple of really cool hot rods, and tell me how that that happens. I mean, it is it a a client of yours that purchased those cars? From yeah. Chip? So, so um, this particular car was owned by a guy named Pierce Marshall, who we came to know through he he bought a bunch of the Pratt Miller Corvettes. He's a big uh, Chevrolet guy, you know, and um, when the Cadillac deal started you know, with the DPI car started coming to an end, I started working kind of both ends, getting with GM and and Pierce about, you know, seeing where the cars were going to end up. And and fortunately, we ended up with, with the O2 car. And, um, you know, it's been pretty cool being able to... Uh, yeah, so we know. only have one at the moment. You only have one. Yeah. Yep. We're at working the on it at the moment. At the moment. We're yeah. working on another one, maybe. So, is, okay. that the, is that the Cadillac, the... the battery assist or whatever no it's so the one the car before that car before it okay yeah um and you know when we when we made all these deals um you know that we got all the part all the spare parts body work chassis parts suspension you know and when we started making you know making sure we had everything it was you know the plan from our set both our side in and pierce the guy that owns the car we wanted to run it like we ran it in the day you know and and that's why he wanted us involved, you know, to make sure that it was at, you know, those cars are a lot of work no matter how you cut it. So what does that look like? You said all the spare parts and pieces, but there's also special tools that are designed and, and made for those cars, set up pads, all of that sort of stuff. All of that came with, with yep. the package? Yeah, that was, so I guess fortunately for us, um, none of that stuff transferred over to the new GTP car, right? And I guess in the position that I was in, I had, I had the knowledge to know what you needed and didn't need. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, having been involved in, you know, all the development on the new GTP car, you know, knowing that nothing transferred, being able to, you know, not necessarily convince anybody to sell anything, but know that it was no use to them, right. To, to Ganassi and, and, well, you're a great informer, so you could let Ganassi know, listen, well, we're not going to use this stuff anymore on the new GTPs. Yep. You might as well put it all in the package and sell it to this guy. Exactly. And, and you know, that's one thing that they kind of weren't used to with all the IndyCar stuff, because everything, tra even when there's new chassis, right, everything transfers over. It's all the same equipment, all the same stuff, right? So this was a little bit of a unique situation for everybody to be able to... Lock, you know, shock, and barrel, man. Yeah. And, 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 and we... And we really weren't looking for a deal. No. We just want, the deal was getting all the right stuff. Right. Yeah. And we were willing to pay for it. And uh, That's I think it worked out really good for, oh, oh yeah. yeah. For Chip yeah. and for us, it's just like, you know, we had a couple of less starter problem and we had, you know, electrical problem. And, oh, we go to the trailer and we got another one, you know, yeah. the the rear third, we broke one of the third springs at Sebring and uh, Phil runs in there and gets the spare, put it on there and away we go. So, yeah. put a whooping on us and, uh, I tell people I'm only afraid of one thing. She's at home, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at Dan and his son, Phil Binks, two of the best crew chiefs that have graced the paddock in both EMSA and vintage racing as it stands right now. Just starting off in Binks Motorsports and have a couple of really, really cool cars that they take care of here in the... Um, the DPI ranks, but I love the fact you were with, so you were with Pratt and Miller for mi all of those years, I guess, with Corvette, right? And and whenever you retired, I think you were in the game for 38 years. What right. was it, 2020? You you decided you were going to retire. And then you got busier than, <laughs> than you, I don't know if you were busier than you ever were in racing. I don't know if you could be any busier than, than what you did. But once you decided to retire, that kind of opened up the door for, like you just said, those clients that had those, that bought those Corvettes that you worked on for so many years, had so much success with, they can go right to the cat that had his hands all over those things and you can take care of them. And then, of course, you follow in the same footsteps. You guys see an opportunity here. And now uh, the DPI cars with the Cadillacs that we were talking about. And whenever I teased going to break, I, I had a couple more questions. You said that the guy is 54 years old. For the fans at home that aren't familiar with these cars, they are indie cars with bodies on them. I mean, we're talking about absolute rocket ships, the fastest cars that you can, that you can buy. I mean, cars capable of going 200 miles per hour at Daytona. And... 
they load these things up, dude. Those G-forces are, are real. And when you're 54 years old, some of the best drivers on the planet can't hang with those things. So what's it look like when these, when these gentlemen guys get inside of these cars? Yeah, I mean, we added a little bit of, uh, we call it creature comfort. You know, we added a cool suit, which it didn't have originally. We uh, changed some stuff around with the braking system to make it a little more, I guess, comfortable to drive for him. Um, but I mean, really and truly, I mean, he puts in the work. He, you know, he has a, a driver coach, Eric Foss, that helps him out all the time that, you know, they they take it seriously, really, really serious. You know, it's uh, it wasn't. I didn't really know what to expect going into it, you know, and it was uh, it was cool to see that they, you know, it's not a, a lot of people think it's a car show, right? It's the, these guys, they they put the work in, you know. I think it's important for you. I mean, you guys want to win. That's oh, yeah. how you guys are wired. I mean, it's one thing to have a business and make some money and have a client with that wealth. But if you're going to work that hard on a car, you want to see that car go out and perform. It's important. Yeah. And I mean, those cars, I mean, you, you've been around them too. I mean, you, those things, they don't go slow very good, right? You have to get all the arrow to work and, and you, you have to drive the thing to its Rusted. ability. Oh yeah. And it was hard for them to wrap their heads around the, you know, how, how good the brakes were, how, how much arrow it had and, and all that stuff. It, it took a little bit to, to work up to it. You know, just a, almost a trust thing really. Yeah. And, and that's, um, it's a downforce car. So you've got oh, yeah. to go up, hammer the brakes and then bleed it off, otherwise you're locking up tires, which is quite an art. I mean, so it, it's interesting because he's coming out of a GT-style car, uh, GTLM, which, by the way, the, the elite of the GT cars, uh, certainly in their day, but uh, driven a completely different way, it's certainly in the brake zone. Oh, yeah. I mean, to give you an idea, it's 10 seconds faster than a GTLM car Woo. at Sebring. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the pros were in there at a uh, 46 146 and and pierce i think one of 54 and eric went a 49 you know so we're three four five seconds off but but for a gentleman driver i mean that's you know unheard of and uh and he's just getting better because we've really only ran daytona and sebring with no practice time really so uh we're excited for next year yeah and sebring's no joke i mean it's a rough bumpy track you 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 guys both of you guys have wicked amount of test time there so i'm sure you're able to make the the damper package a little more compliant you mentioned the brakes as well so to, to help those guys get around help them out a little bit oh yeah yeah i mean it i was a little bit worried going there you know he he had driven his corvettes there a bunch but you know that's a big gt car a lot you know a lot more suspension travel comparative to a you know a, a tpi the thing you know really stiff you know set up softer than we would anywhere else obviously but uh still you know the bumps are the bumps are real at Sebring. So w what did he look like when he after the very first time inside of the car and he goes out and puts that thing in anger a little bit and comes back climbs out of the car what smiling from ear to ear? Oh man, he was <laughs> he was hooting and hollering on the radio, you know, <laughs> just I mean, jumping out, hugging everybody. He was super fired up, you know, super fired up and a little huffing and puffing too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he came in and was like, "Woo!" And he sat there for a few minutes and getting his breath and got his helmet off and then climbed out. He, yeah, it was a lot of work for him, but uh, uh, it was super exciting. And to beat the Acura there was uh, pretty cool. I think they had pretty big confidence they were gonna put a whooping on us. And uh, I tell people I'm only afraid of one thing: she's at home. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's pretty cool, though. I mean, and then, and then, like you say, the Acura is out there, and and what does that program look like? But is it a similar program? Drivers, you know, so that yeah. they they contracted Aero Motorsports that that runs a P two really? car, yeah, Aero Motorsports, yeah, yeah. So they had their semi and all their stuff, and yeah. Uh, so yeah, well, they that, had the whole P two team. You know, most of their P two team there running the Acura. You know, wow. So it's you know, and and then, I mean. There was a Audi R8 there with all of Brad Kettler's guys working on it. You know, it it's a uh, it's a transition from all the pros yeah. into vintage racing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we yeah, just, do you see it coming that way? So, what, do they have any uh, longer races where they would use multiple drivers? Where maybe some of the older pros that that are no longer in competition come over and play a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Daytona was um, the way they had it structured. We ended up uh, what four or five hours on track. Yeah. So, and I mean, Marcel Fassler was there driving the car that beat us. Marcel Fassler was driving, so yeah. we, we felt pretty good about that. With you know, 
We were close uh, to him even with. Well, yeah. I would think it would once the word gets out that these drivers are competing, it's going to be a massive draw for fans. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. There was, I mean, the campgrounds were full at Daytona. I thought it was awesome, right? I mean, people that, you know, a lot of. Because you're. <laughs> The IMSA deal, right, with the fans for me is always, you know, the fans that come to the track in an IMSA race are just diehard, you know, and they know the cars, they know all the people. Yeah, exactly. And and those guys are kind of doubling back, understanding now that a lot of these older cars that they went and watched in the day are running at these races and they can go see them still, you know. And who's saying shit's that, like at the Daytona? So that's uh, HSR as well, which is now owned by IMSA, so it's a little bit of a um so they're seeing the value in it too right yeah yeah Yeah. it's it's like it's going to be more of a happening at sebring there was an airplane show the airplanes all landed at like five o'clock so once the cars are done they had airplane show i mean they're making an event so it's uh it's exciting times for and i would have to think for you guys as well it's such it's so more relaxed I, i mean i know you guys are serious about what you do and you want to win but still in comparison to an imsa event and the pressures that come with a chip ganassi racing or a pratt and miller effort gm effort i mean it's nothing like that yeah you're not worried about you know going to tech and failing because the wing height some you know (laughs) half a mil off or you know whatever you know you're not stuff like that the you know the skidware rule and all that stuff you don't you don't necessarily worry about all that you know Still, then your then your main focus just becomes car performance. You're not worried about a rule book that thick, you know. Great stuff, man. These yeah. guys are enjoying what they're doing, and they're doing it together. That's pretty unique as well. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To this day, I carry those pictures in my backpack, and people think, well, why do you do that? And it's because I don't ever want to forget that. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're at the Mav TV booth, which is the home of the Skinny, starting our third year here on the network. We're certainly proud to uh, to be here. We appreciate everything that they've done for us as well. I'm Ken Stout. The big man sitting alongside that is Rico Elmore. For once, we have somebody to counterweight the stage for us as we brought the Binks boys in here. <laughs> we can we can joke with them a little bit. Uh, everybody pounds on us, so it's great to have some big boys in here on the stage with us. Uh, both of these guys are outstanding crew chiefs. Dan, uh, just in Inducted into the Corvette Hall of Fame here in 2023. So great stuff right there as well. Congratulations on that. We've been talking about what they uh, just started here with Binks Motorsports and taking care of some client cars. I want to go back in and talk a little bit more about the history. I know you have some wonderful stories along the way, but some of those stories can be pretty horrific. And uh, you'd mentioned Tommy Tommy Kendall a little bit uh, earlier. I know that you were working on the cars there in the 90s with him. Talk to me about 1991 at Watkins Glen. Yeah. Um, started out, I looked like we were going to maybe be able to win that race. And uh, the rear hub broke and Tommy crashed really bad and broke in both his legs. And and uh, I was ready to quit. I, uh, you know, we had talked to Trammel, uh, got airplane rides from the you know, racetrack to the hospital, they got him stabilized. They sent him to Indianapolis. Uh, the next day I drove to Indianapolis and it was like, I, I just couldn't believe that, you know, I hurt my friend or, you know, I mean, it, it, you always take that chance of working on these race cars and things happen. But, uh, you know, here's this guy with machines hooked to him and his legs are literally destroyed. And, uh, you know, I was like, Hey, I, I need to do something else. You know, this is, uh, this is too hard on me. And, and Tommy said, we're not quitting. Go home, work, get me another car, and we'll be fine. Really? And, and uh, I'm glad he did that because I was really ready to do something else because uh, it was just devastating. And uh, we went on to win, you know, another 50 races with Tommy. And uh, so the highs and the lows are, you know, I think you remember the lows a little bit harsher. You know, they're in your brain etched because it was such a horrific deal. But uh, the positives are they outweigh him for sure. And and Tommy's tough. You know, he just he just wanted to be a race car driver and he knew there was chances like that that happened. And, uh, you know, really not too much earlier than that. You know, people didn't survive from those accidents. And, you know, with guys like Trammell and stuff, you know, uh, put them back together. It's unbelievable. Were there any advancements, safety advancements that came out of that incident? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um we had done, you know, studies on why did it break. Um, 
there was some human error in a couple of them, and I was involved in one of them. And, you know, you put that in your book. Uh, to this day, I carry those pictures in my backpack, and people think, well, why do you do that? And it's because I don't ever want to forget that, that safety is the number one deal. And I had uh, Darren Knight drive one of my midgets, and he came and tested at, uh, in Mooresville, North Carolina, at the little track there. And he, his helmet was like, I don't know, three or four years old. I said, you're not driving my midget at the Chili Bowl with that helmet. You know, you need to buy a new one and send me the bill. And it's just, you got to do all the things and things can still happen. But now I just make sure that it's as safe as it can be. Yeah. And then, and then at least you can sleep at night. Exactly. You did everything you could possibly do. I did everything I could do. Given technology today. And, you know, things, you know, could slip through the cracks, but you try not to. You would also mention the the Dale Earnhardt Jr. deal. I mean, you guys are, you were in some pretty horrific moments along the way man yeah so we did that car at sears point and uh junior wanted to drive it they had driven together at daytona and yeah, i think uh, i think we ought to start with him and his dad you know that's what that's what originally started because it leads into the dale jr situation i mean him and his dad ran where where did that first start at was that daytona so or? they wanted to run daytona and and they sort of were the the guys that started that because later on, then there are a bunch of people running DP cars and DPI cars, but, but Dale wanted to go to Lamar. And, uh, that was actually before I got to Corvette racing when Dale won there in 2001. And, uh, they both drove it. And then the, the plan later was that Dale was going to drive at Lamar in 2003 or four, depending on how the NASCAR schedule worked. And, uh, so they just enjoyed the cars a lot. I mean, they're, compared to a cup car on a road course is just there's no comparison they're just so much faster and then uh then that's when we took dale to sears point is that dale jr is that when he yeah yep so um we ran practice we're in qualifying i think boris and him were i think they qualified fourth went out for the morning warm-up full tank of gas sticker tires and uh dale lost it coming down the s's there and hit the wall pretty much where nobody else had hit it and uh because the gas tank was full it it squeezed it like a zit and just squished the fuel out and uh you know the rest was history it really was a dangerous situation big fire um he was able to get out he, uh, if you hear the story, he said he thought his dad helped him get out. Yeah, that because was, uh, he said he didn't remember. He didn't like, remember anything. Out and he felt uh, like he like was, almost a surreal. Like he's being elevated out yeah. of it, which yep. I thought was. Pretty it was wild. a little scary for me. A little bit, uh, you know. It's funny because I want to say Grosjean almost had a description similar to that deal climbing out of his fire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, anyways, he got out, um, and you know was okay. He had some burns on his legs and stuff, but um, and then never came back to drive with us. But uh, uh, unfortunately, because I think that I think he would have been pretty good. Um, he was just getting the used to the data because you know he's driving cup cars where they don't have data, and we have all the data. You know, a few hundred channels. You can see we have time gain loss on the dash, so he knew what he had to do compared to Boris in the same car. So. Um, but things happen and, and so it part goes. Of, yeah, that's right. Once again, we have Dan and Phil Binks here, as we've talked about, they started Binks Motorsports and we want to touch on that when we come back. This guy's quite an amazing engine builder as well. Half the people in the world lie about it anyway, so whatever. I don't need to lie to you. I about just, 800 uh, horse. Yeah, 1100. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways. The Skinny is brought to you by American Coach. American Coach, innovation is our life force. And Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to The Skinny. We're downtown Indianapolis here cutting this show in the Mav TV booth. We have the Binks boys here on the set with us. I'm Ken Stout. That's Rico Elmore. Steve Grine and the gang back there cutting the show together. It's shot a little bit different here, but we love the look for sure. And by the way, as we kick off this season, we're also going to change our setup. So we'll have a new uh, we'll have a new stage whenever we get going. Big guy here is working on that as we speak. I uh, want to welcome these guys back here to this to the show as well as we've covered a little bit here and there. We've been kind of jotting around. The career is so lengthy, it's it's hard to run through the entire thing. But um, so you retired after 38 years and you decide, hey, I'm going to take a break here and 
I'm just going to relax and have some fun. And next thing I know, you're calling me. You're like, hey, man, I'm building an engine. I, what do you think about this midget stuff? I want to go to the Chili Bowl. I love the Chili Bowl. I always wanted to go to the Chili Bowl. I've never done dirt racing before. So for near 40 years, you're on asphalt. You're a master at it. Now you want to go over here and play in the dirt. And you want to do it at the most prestigious, toughest midget race on the planet because that's who you are. <laughs> you want to race the absolute best. That's just the way it is. And you start digging, man, and you build your own engine. You come up with a couple different versions of it. So fill us in. Yeah, so uh, I bought two dirt cars from uh, Clawson and uh, built two engines, my own engines. They're Chevy-based and uh, LS7Rs, and uh, I built a three-cylinder engine. And uh, so we'd never been to the Chili Bowl. Bought the cars, put them all together. Cody tested one of them, and uh, Darren Knight had tested the three-cylinder. I thought it would be, uh, he's a micro driver at the time, and I thought that it would be more in his wheelhouse for that, and Cody being more conventional with the four-cylinder. And, um, yeah, I just had a dream on the engines that it that it would work, and a uh, couple of weird things. The three-cylinder doesn't have any water, so most engines have water. That one doesn't. It was all about weight and uh so we dreamed it up. We took it down to Kevin Doran's and started it up. And uh, the third pull, it made really good power, uh, really good torque. And uh, That's a political answer, by the way. You know, you'll never find out what it makes. Yeah, no, we try not to tell anybody what it makes. Exactly what I was thinking. Half the people in the world lie about it anyway, so whatever. I don't need to lie to you. I about just, 800 uh, horse. Yeah, 1,100. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, so we fire off of the Chili Bowl, and uh, Darren won the third race that he was in, and two races later, Cody won. So uh, not to discount what the Chili Bowl is, I put in the effort, and it, the things that I didn't know, I either paid for the information or got it from the drivers and worked really hard, and uh, then I'm then I was hooked. You know, uh, I told my wife when we won the third race that we were in ever, I said it could have cost double and I'd have done it. It was so exciting. And, uh, Bondio, one of the other guys that runs at the chili bowl forever. I worked with him in the, in the eighties, you know, he said, what do you think banks, you can come and win the Indy 500. Cause that's what they compare the, it's actually, I would believe it's harder because there's 400 cars trying to be there instead you of 33. It. So, you got it. uh, one of the hardest races to win in the world. And, uh, we were fortunate enough to go there and do okay. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. What did you do with Bondio? Uh, Bondio and I worked on the uh, Mazdas together. Oh, and, really? Yep. With the GTU uh, cars? GTU cars and GTO cars um, with Clayton. You know, Jack Baldwin drove and Tommy drove. And then uh, Bondio stayed there and worked with Millen and all those guys. And I moved to Michigan. Yeah, Bondio always, I mean, He's a magic always guy. a contender. Yep. He's a oh, magic he's a contender guy. out yeah. there yeah. with uh oh he's legendary with, uh, he won't yeah. listen to me <laughs> with the uh carbon uh kenny and oh, all yeah. those guys are always they're the greatest there. and they're they're cool to hang out with and uh knowledgeable about a lot of things yeah and it, and bonio's dad worked for parnelli uh, oh, really? oh wow. a lot of people don't know that like those viceroy cars with the angled wings mm -hmm. and all that yeah andy andy's dad worked on that stuff so uh super i was not expecting to hear Andy Bondio's name yeah, here no. in this interview at all. No, so the no. guy's loaded with surprises here. Uh, we have plenty more to go. Stay with us. We'll be back with more with both Dan and Phil. We were flying under the radar, had no idea. We won by 200 laps <laughs> at Toledo Speedway. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That is wrong. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to The Skinny. We're having a great time here with both Dan and Phil Binks, covering a lot of ground here. Dan, who's been immersed in this industry for some 40 years now, and of course, his son being raised right alongside, right in the middle of it as well, both extremely talented. We've been talking about some pretty hardcore racing, so uh, I want to take it up a level because this guy has also built successful lemons cars. Lamon's Lamon's cars. It's a twenty-four yeah. hour. Yeah, twenty-four outfit. hours of lemons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's cheating, dude. Yeah. You, somebody of your status, should not be allowed to build one of those cars. So the first one we ever went to was at Toledo Speedway, and they didn't know who we were. We were flying under the radar, had no idea. We won by two hundred laps. <laughs> 
at Toledo Speedway. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, that is wrong. That's wrong. That's way wrong, dude. Yeah, we put that's a, not what the class is about. <laughs> we put a hurting on them, and they gave did us. They, did they figure out who you were? They quick? did. They did, and the next time they weren't so nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we come in and make a mockery of their mockery. What yeah, you the it? next one they said they were going to take our engine. Um, so it was awesome. I had, a, is there a claim rule? Oh, there is a claim rule. Oh yeah, and uh, so we took this engine. It was a pretty. It was a 406 for my Camaro, and we put steel wool all over it and poured water on it to make it all rusty. And then when we showed up there, they said, uh, well, we want to look at the engine. I was like, all right. So they're looking around, and he said, well, what will we see if we take the valve covers off? And I said, well, how about comp roller rockers? <laughs> they were taking it off anyways. They had the wrenches in their hand. <laughs> and he took it off there, and it was like, whoa. <laughs> Jewelry store. <laughs> so the appearance didn't help with the uh the five hundred dollar claim rule was <laughs> no. worth every penny. <laughs> no. No, I think it made four eighty to the tires or something. It was Oh man. They didn't like it very much. So then uh Chump Car came out and then we can run in the wide open class. But we actually did win the uh at Road America with our V six. Yeah. So we built a a V six like out of a in a marine engine. It was hot too. It was not as you can imagine, it w- it was really good. I think it went 150 miles an hour at Road America in a vintage r- in a chump car race. So who it, was driving that, that? That we both drove yeah. it. A couple friends of mine, and uh, and then when he moved to Indy, we sold it. So uh, that car was really cool. We did a bunch yeah. of bunch of cool stuff with that thing. Yeah, just kind of feel light up, man. Yeah. Big smile on his face. Yeah. Like, that's fun, though, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. that's what it's all about. Having yeah. a little bit of fun. My my logo is it. We race everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Pinewood Derby uh, to to whatever. So we, we just love racing. That's super cool. Super cool. Hey, man, I also want to touch on the story about how, how you got back up to Michigan. You currently reside in Michigan, but we documented that you, you pretty much grew up there in SoCal. Talk to me about how you ended up back up in Michigan because I, I found it pretty pretty interesting. So I had worked with Tommy in 87 on the RX-7, and then Tommy signed a deal with Chevrolet and to race the Berettas in GTU, and uh, he went there, and they ran, uh, I think they ran Daytona, and they ran Sebring, and didn't finish either one, and and Tommy said, man, we got to get Binks here, and uh, my wife was from Michigan, so it wasn't too hard to convince us to move to Michigan, and then uh, the biggest problem was they didn't want to pay me, and I said, okay. That's a problem. I said, that you know, that's a problem. Tommy said, hey, I'll make it right or whatever. And uh, I said, here's the deal. You pay me what you want to pay me. And if we win the championship, it's double. And they were, okay. They already, I mean, they basically had five points. The first two races were a joke. And uh, so I went back there, did Dan Bank stuff, working on the car, and and really just helping them with all their people to pull the rope in the right direction, right? This guy's were thinking about this and that and whatever. I was like, dude, we all got to think together. We got to work on our cars and make them good and go win some races. And that's what we did. And we ended up winning the championship with one race to go. And uh, so I tell people there was 13 races and we started with a two race handicap and we finished one race early. And uh, I got my bonus. I bought my house, my first house with the bonus that I got there. So, um, it was super cool um, to get to get a chance to go somewhere that was not good and nurture it into a real race team. And we won uh, two championships there, uh, 88 and 90. We won the Trans Am Championship at Cars and Concepts. Want to get the skinny on other guests in different types of motorsports? Check out our YouTube page and get the skinny. The Skinny is brought to you by Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. And American Coach, innovation is our life force. Welcome back to The Skinny. We're here at the Mav TV booth. We have both Dan and Phil Binks sitting alongside Hall of Famer crew chiefs and uh, may- maybe even can consider this one a future Hall of Famer crew chief. Well, uh, he's got a few few years to go to, to catch this guy, though, and, and put that level of work in, but certainly has that work ethic. We were chatting during the commercial break here, and I had it written down in my notes, but um, it's it's really cool that you guys work together, but 
it's a greater story to know that you raced against each other, and you've done so at the at the biggest events, including 24 Hours of Le Mans. Yeah. Yeah, so when I moved to Indy, um, ended up working at Chip Ganassi. Uh, I was there for eight years, I guess. And uh, when I was hired on, I was hired on to be mechanic on the 4GT program. And and um, be, racing being a small community, you know, you get get to know a lot of people, right? And uh, oddly enough, when they hired me there, they didn't know who my dad was. <laughs> and this and, was a GTLM uh, car. We oh should yeah, say. yeah, yeah. We're racing GTLM against each other, right? And and we didn't think anything of it, right? You know, it's like for us, it's just that's this is works. what we're gonna do, right? This is racing. We're you know, I want to beat him probably more than the next guy, right? And uh, there was some at first. There might have been some some hurt feelings at at chips, but it all worked out, and we. Uh, you race. can't go swapping information. I mean, it's no, the, no. the brains go crazy. Yeah, it's like no, there's no way that's right. going to happen. No, we're both and so competitive that that's not an option. Yeah. So, and you know, that was a cool program to be a part of. We, uh, you know, at that time, GTLM was, in my opinion, some of the best. Oh no, G- question GT, if not sports car racing in the world. I mean, it was. You know, you had us with the Fords, him with the. The Corvettes and, you know, Ferrari was over there. Porsche was here, uh, Aston. you know, Aston Martin, you know, I mean, it was just those battles were vicious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You'd go there, you know, even when the car count started to get small at the end, you know, there was six or eight cars, but there was six or eight cars that were Getting capable of winning at any track that we went to, you know, and then you go to Le Mans, there's, you know, 15, 16 cars in the class of the same caliber, right? You're just, it's going to be a fist fight for 24 hours and. Yeah, and, and as I read those stories, everybody thought oh, when you guys first came out with with the four GTs, they thought, "Oh man, these cars are more advanced. They they're going to have an advantage over the Corvettes, which were built for the masses, really, and turned into a race car." And strong and steady over here, he's like, "Yeah, let them let them do whatever they do. We're going to do what we do over here. We'll see what we got." And you guys go out and you beat the the Fords there at yeah. first, but it didn't didn't take Chip too long to get caught up with the program. Now we uh. We struggled at the beginning just getting, I mean, any, any new program with a car is tough. Right. And, uh, and you know, these guys had time on their side, right. They had, you know, if you look at those at the Corvettes throughout the years, right. From C5 to, well, until they went to the C8, right. They were all just like, uh, evolutions of the last one. Right. And, and it's hard to, it's hard to beat that. Right. That information is something that you can't, you know, you can't buy, you can't, research that you can't you know you just have to you have to do it and we 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 got there we want to we want a bunch of races with those cars so what was thanksgiving dinner like you know what what, 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 is there some bragging rights what goes on between you guys well i think they they won lama in 16 and 16 and then we won the championship in america yeah at at uh petita we actually had trouble we crashed and fixed our car under yellow, and I went down and congratulated them for the championship. And then they, I get spun out. No, so there, was some, <laughs> there was some. It was one of those oh, weird points wow. deals where as long as as long as the Ferrari didn't win, we were okay, right? <laughs> and he comes over with three hours to go and shakes my hand and congratulates me. And then the Ferrari just drives around everybody and wins. And then they <laughs> ended up winning the championship <laughs> after I congratulated. Like, Talk about how to feel like a jackass. <laughs> wow. <laughs> my wife was yelling at me. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah, just, yeah. Uh, but that's how racing is, right? The highs and the lows. We talked about that earlier. It's just uh, you never know when it's over. So, yeah. Great to have you guys on the set, man. Spend some time with us. Um, is the door open to anybody that has a race car? No. No? No? It's a secluded <laughs> club to get into the Banks Motorsports Garage? You for, can't for, get in, Stout, if that's what yeah, you're you having can't get in, right? Because I've got this car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Got this Corvette. I could use some help on yeah. it. Yeah. I got him some headlights that you couldn't get. Yeah, he did. He did. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> At the moment, uh, we're, we're full up with our customer stuff and the sprint car stuff and all that. We're having fun. Yeah, congrats, man. Thanks That's for having awesome. Us. Glad you guys could uh, could pull it together and work together as well. Very, very uh, unique situation. And uh, man, time with your son, best time Priceless, ever. Spent. You know, yep, absolutely right. So once again, Dan and Phil Binks, uh, wonderful to have them on the show here. Uh, keep an eye on them; they'll be at uh, a bunch of those HSR vintage events with some of the coolest cars on the planet. Oh, and the Chili Bowl. And the Chili Bowl. <laughs>